This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. We live in a rapidly evolving digital world. You are using technology to work, play, and connect with each other. You spend a lot of time watching, listening, and consuming media. Technology has become essential in every part of our lives, from health to education, from safety to security, and to the strength of the economy. You deserve communications networks and services that you can count on. The CRTC plays an important role to make that a reality. Welcome back to the Law Bites podcast for 2023. The start of a new year often means a fresh start, and for the CRTC, it meant welcoming a new chair, as Vicky Atreides, a competition lawyer, officially took over as the chair of the CRTC a few days into the new year. Ms. Atreides comes to the commission at a particularly busy time, with wireless competition concerns top of mind for many Canadians, and the government set to ask the commission to play a pivotal role in implementing bills C-11 and C-18. Conrad von Finkenstein is someone who knows quite a bit about the challenges faced by new CRTC chairs, having served in the role from 2007 to 2012. Conrad was recently appointed to the Order of Canada for his many contributions to public life, and he joins me on the podcast to reflect on those experiences in the context of the CRTC. Our conversation reflects on what is involved in launching entirely new programs, ensuring public engagement, and developing policies that enjoy both public support and that can withstand potential legal challenges. Conrad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks so much for joining. You know, we're recording in January, just days after you named to the Order of Canada. So congratulations. It's, it's, a, it's a well-deserved honor, and it's a pleasure to, to have you come on. Uh, it's also just a few days after the CRTC has a new chair, Vicky Atreides, who comes to the position with a background in competition law and policy. Now, with the new chair and, of course, with both Bill C-11 and C-18 still making their way through the parliamentary process, Senate's pretty much done, it seems, one one last vote on C-11, and it's soon going to face C-18. These are issues that seem almost certain to head to the CRTC in the coming year, which suggests an, an awful lot of work for the commission. You faced something somewhat similar when you led the CRTC through some new mandated programs, and so it's great to have the chance to talk about uh, what a new chair faces, what the CRTC faces, and and some of the challenges that lie ahead. Why don't we start then with 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 that sort of broad question? You know, what are some of the broader constraints that the CRTC needs to consider in you in your view when it's implementing a new program? Well, thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, you're absolutely right. There's a new, large new task now awaiting the CRTC. These two bills will require really a whole new way, a whole new implementation structure. And when you're at the CSTC and you do that, you're facing several constraints. Basically, you've been delegated policy making, and you have to make that put a purchase, convert that policy uh, into a workable construct. Now, there are several constraints. First of all, the CRTC is a court of record, so everybody needs to be heard, and you have to take in what everybody who's concerned suggests you should do. Secondly, it also means that you have to be, there's a due process. You know, you, you can be reviewed judicially, and therefore the process has to be open, transparent, and give everybody a chance. There's a constitutional constraints that you worry about the division of powers and you don't want to step on provincial jurisdiction. There's also charter of right issues in when you deal with freedom of speech. And there's always the possibility of a appeal to cabinet on the merits, basically suggesting you got it wrong and you should redo it. And lastly, there are ministerial directions, which they haven't been issued yet, but they undoubtedly will. And you have to respect them and come, uh, see how they uh, can be married with what's in the, uh, in the um, legislation. So the, the, you're not free to just sit down and make a policy. You have to have to have, have all of these constraints. 
And then secondly, when you approach this, you have to really if beforehand in your mind have at least a conceptual framework. What, how is this going to work? What will it be? If I, if I could do it, I would do it this way. Now you will hear the submission from everybody and you may change it, but you need to know where you want to go and what's out there and that makes the necessary changes. That are there. And in, in, in both of these cases, given the very broad discretion that has been granted to the CRTC, this will be an enormous undertaking, both in terms of, first of all, getting that conceptual framework and then getting it validated through uh, or changed through hearings. Yeah, well, that, I mean, there's obviously a, a ton there. You know, if you were to put yourself in the chair's shoes, you know, how prepared do you think the CRTC is to handle some of these issues. I mean, there's there's a lot of different obligations. And I think notably, we're talking about issues that previously weren't uh, either weren't part of the CRTC's mandate or they weren't directly involved with things like Internet streamers and now news arbitration. You know, it's a pretty significant expansion of the mandate. How prepared do you think the, the commission is going to be to handle some of these things? Well, I, <clears throat> they have been given new resources and uh, they can obviously hire the necessary people. Are they prepared to it intellectually? Uh, not really. It's, as you say, these are no new areas that they haven't dealt with before. Secondly, there's also a question of organizationally. You're dealing now with air streaming, or let's call it that for some you know, or internet uh, broadcasting over the internet. That's quite different than the appointment broadcasting we've had so far. And there are pros and cons. Obviously, if you have the broadcasting division deal with this too, they will have a broadcasting mindset and they will want to impose those concepts and those ways of doing on the on the internet. It's, it will be their default position will be, that's for how we did it here, how can we do it? Or do you create a whole new set of division which costs you on terms of internal uh, a bit of rivalry, how do you co combine the two, etc. So that's a fairly large organizational thing. And the second one, you mentioned uh, arbitration as a whole C18 procedure and news. Again, that's all, all new too. So it'll be interesting to see how they set themselves up. I, my, <laughs> if I was there, I would think I would set up a new division. Otherwise, you get everybody constantly trying to impose what's already there as a default on the new world. And the internet and the whole streaming is a whole is a new way of approaching things. And it shouldn't be carry the ballast of previous years and previous devices as far as I'm concerned. That's a really interesting suggestion about just taking it and making it a separate department or a separate area so that There's you don't have division, some, of that, yeah. some of those legacy views. Um, you know, when you were at the CRTC, you faced in some ways, as we were saying, some new issues and issues that, that required creating something based on a government yeah. mandate. And I'm thinking in particular of the do not call list. Um, can you describe what that was and, and how the CRTC went about establishing the do not call system essentially from scratch? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the perfect thing, you had the act, it was there, pretty broad concepts, and you had to work those out. Also, the, <clears throat> and there was no uh, funding provided for it. So we found, had to invent, find, invent a way of running the program without funding, which was not quite... A, and also some internal government procedures, for instance, we wanted to call in a request for proposal. You have to go through this through the Department of, <coughs> of Government Procurement, which takes about a year to do. Unfortunately, since we were not going to ask for money, we said we can do it on our own because there's no outlay. And so we got around that. But these are sort of internal here, poor problems here. Then secondly is uh, set up the system and validate it. And there are all sorts of issues there. <clears throat> For instance, the do not call list obviously doesn't apply to somebody with whom you have an ongoing business relationship. They're allowed to call you, etc. But what is an ongoing representative? How does it, you know, the uh, in, how do you define it for how long, uh, etc. Et so we did it quite a bit of internal, uh, in effect, conceptualizing, trying to figure out how it works. And then you have consultations. And then uh, we did, once we uh, issued the RFP and we had a successful bidder, we worked out the details for them. But all it shows you that, in, again, when, when the broader the mandate is, 
the greater the expectation, the more people will come to you and come suggestion and things like that. So it, 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 it's helpful if the legislation is tight and gives a specific target. If it's wide, it makes it more difficult, makes it possible. What we've learned more than anything in the, in, in the, <coughs> the do not call list is that uh, manage expectations. Make sure you explain pre precisely what can be done and what cannot be done and bring up sort of under promise and over over deliver rather than because everybody walks in sky high high expectations and you have to bring them down because you can't possibly live up to them and then was the whole enforcement system the crtc is a regulator they had never enforced and this was really an enforcement this is really it's not criminal, but it's effectively you find people and, 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 and etc. So that requires a different mindset. It requires people to who investigate, select the evidence, make it stand up so that you can make a proper uh, charge. And also that if there is a judicial review, which undoubtedly there will be, or a, or a contestation, you can defend it court wise. So we, in effect, created a new division for enforcement, which wasn't there before. Okay. I mean, interesting, all the kind of new things that you had to create. Uh, certainly when you talk about uh, sky-high expectations, Bill C-11 comes to mind because it's quite clear that there are a number of groups that have very you know, significant expectations, and they've been fueled, I think, in part by the government that have suggested that this is, you know, has the potential to be bonanza in effect in terms of some of the, the revenues that, that may come come way towards the industry. So, so C11, I think it's fair to say there are very high expectations. There are an astonishing lar st astonishingly large number of issues the CRTC will face, everything from CanCon rules to the thresholds to the kinds of contributions from internet streamers. You know, where to even begin? You've written about scoping hearings and key issues hearings. Can you explain a little bit, you know, how, how you unpack this, this real giant of a piece of legislation should it ultimately receive approval? Well, for first uh, issue, as you say, is scoping. It. Who does it apply to? Who are the people who will have to be, uh, be, uh, be subject to uh, the new, new act? The key provisions, as you know, are in Section 9.1, but who has to live up to this? And the, under the definition right now, essentially anybody who uh, produces sound or video online gets captured by it. The definitions are so broad. So how do you know? Do you have to bring in threshold? Presumably a threshold in terms of numbers, subscribers, or revenue per year. You know, I, I would think... You, we all know it was meant to, uh, aimed at Netflix, the Prime, and, and Disney, etc. So where do you set the threshold? You have to set it high enough so you don't uh, impede in innovations for small uh, new entrants. On the other hand, you want to make sure that there's those people who really do play in the Canadian broadcasting field and are now acting at broadcasts that pay their fair contribution. The threshold should be in terms of uh, of revenue or subscribers or both. We want to make sure you catch the big boys, the Hulus and the uh, Netflix, and you do not uh, uh, hurt innovation and uh, subject people to the regime who are just starting up and who are starting new and inventive ways uh, of, of doing. You also want to make sure that the regime captures Canadian uh, streamers such as uh, Illico and uh, Crave TV. So it says, has probably somewhere around 100 million, is, I would have thought so. And then secondly, you want to make sure that you're only dealing with people in English or French. I don't think there's any intention of dealing with people in certain languages. That is the very first thing that you have to hold a hearing saying, who will this apply to so that you bring it into a manageable uh, world? And then secondly, what are the things that you're going to impose upon them? The way the Act was written has taken basically all the powers that the CITC has and can impose on broadcasters and allows them to impose the same obligations on online broadcasters. That obviously makes no sense. A lot of them makes no sense at all. Others maybe partially can be applied to. but uh, that. And then thirdly, you have to figure out what are they supposed to do? What are they, uh, they are supposed to pay contribution to whom? In what amount? 
in to what fund, how will it be distributed, who have, will have access to these funds. All of these are open questions. And as you mentioned, the big issue of uh, what's Canadian content. You can't use the existing Canadian uh, provisions because they are all de require... Uh, a, I think they're not very good, as you have written in many instances. But secondly, they require that the, the producer of Canadian content be Canadian owned and that he has, uh, has ownership of the IP rights. Well, that clearly cuts against the Americans and will be, con uh, will be considered a violation under KUSMA, I'm quite sure, and there will be a challenge. So you have to have a new one which does not have this provision, which is not all on the face of it anti-American. There's also regulatory fee that they have to pay which has to be set by, you have to get tariff board approval for it. So all of these various decisions to be done will take an awful long time. It seems, but it seems to me at the very beginning, you want to make sure you bring the scope down. And you may, may have two hearings, just one on the scope. Who are we trying to get a definition on what are online undertakings that are broadcasting that are subject to this act? Let's establish the universe, first of all. And then let's decide what do we impose on that. Or do it two phases, you know. What call it. I want to follow up on a couple of, of things there. One, actually, on the issue of trade, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. This ju just as we're recording it, just this week, there's been a fair amount of press about the U.S. objecting to C11, C18, and raising the prospect of a trade violation. You know, to what extent does the CRTC factor that in? You know, that, that feels like something that a government would factor in within its legislation. But in this instance, one of the real prospects where there may be a vulnerability as you just mentioned is essentially how the crtc interprets the legislation so you know to what extent does the crtc have the capacity or does it factor in potential canada's trade obligations when it's crafting some of these systems well it is as, as you as i started out it's a court of records so it deals well will hear submissions on this point i'm quite sure there will be submissions pro and con of this they can also solicit expert opinion and, and make that available and ask people to comment on it. They can also ask the government, seek, a, seek government opinion. They have, it's, I mean, it seems to me as a CRTC, it, as a public policymaker, it's incumbent on you to make laws that are consistent with Canada's trade obligations. And see, clearly, if you violate them, you should do so consciously. And here, as you know, this year, the uh, KUSMA provides that, yes, you can do certain things for cultural objectives, but if you do so and it hurts the Americans and to the extent of the hurt, they can take retaliatory action. Now, that, no government wants to see that happen and no CRTC should want to see that. Happen. So it's, you, you start off as trying to avoid that at all costs. That's it's good. To, it's good to. It's good to hear that that would be the perspective. You'd hope that would be the perspective. You know, one of the other big issues uh, has to do with language, uh, official language minority rights that are raised in the bill in Section Four Five Point One. You have thoughts on on how that ought to be approached? Obviously, a highly sensitive issue with a piece of legislation that at times feels driven primarily through uh, Quebec interests, and so this is obviously uh, one of the hot button issues for them. Yeah, this is a strange provision that came in, in a, at the last moment uh, it, in the, it was actually put forward in the Senate, which provides that there should be specific consultation with official language minority communities. And that the CRTC has to gather information, propose policies that, that have not been finalized, seek the in input on these not finalized decisions, have a meaningful discussion, be prepared to alter and prepare to give feedback. All of this prior to it actually making a decision on that issue. So it's, it sounds like a, a specific pre-consultation with official languages right before you have a, a, a substantive discussion on this in a, in a hearing that in a, in implicates official languages. And if, if the act says, Decisions that could adversely affect them. Practically any pro uh, any decision in broadcasting could be seen to, uh, to fit that. So what does the CRTC do here? I, it's really a question. My, I, if I was there, I would set this out very carefully as 
This is what I see it means. This is how I would implement it. And then I would make a reference to the federal court and said, I do not want to <laughs> break these provisions. I think this is how we do it. Here is how we set it out. And let the parties come forward and make, I mean, and then I get a judicial imprimatur of whether this is correct or whether it has to be altered or not. The CITC has the power to, to make references. I made two of them while I was chairman, and I found that very useful because it really removes all doubt from it. You now know this can be done because these are not black and white things. These are very gray areas. But these provisions in this, if you read them, they're in section 5.1 of the act, seem to me just made for litigation. On the one hand, if you don't do it, the official language is people will say, we were adversely affected, you didn't go through the procedure. On the other hand, if you do, people will say, you pre-cut the deal. You know, we were prejudiced before you even held the... So you do, you're, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So the way, way out, I would think, is, is to make a reference here. Okay, so you, you've identified an approach that, you know, re in, in many ways, I, I don't know if cautious is the right way, but right word for it, but it certainly is as consultative pos as possible, trying to provide it with, um, with, with strong backing so that, that all, whether they agree with it or not, can feel that they've been appropriately heard. This, I have to say, brings to mind a speech that took place uh, just a day or two ago, as we're recording this from one of the CRTC commissioners, Joanne Levy, who was speaking to an industry group that I and that with comments that I have to say are were largely indistinguishable from government cheerleading on the bill. And, and I, I was curious about your thoughts of when you find the CRTC or CRTC commissioners stepping outside that kind of independent role as the regulator and to effectively cheerlead for a piece of legislation that hasn't even been passed yet. Well, I think as, as the commissioner of the CRTC, whether you're chairman or the commissioner, if you make public speeches, your role is to explain what the CRTC has does, to explain uh, where it's going, suggest uh, uh, where it wants to go or what it sees as challenges coming uh, down the line, and essentially make sure that the decision-making of the CRTC is as transparent as possible and also predictable because you see this is where you're coming from this is the approach that you're taking so that's i think the role it is not to uh, to sheerly use your word government policy but to explain what the crtc is is being, is doing now uh, i uh, that's I, I think that's what I, all I, want, I want to say here this is how commissioners should behave they don't always do it needless to say Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, let's switch to, to C-18. So we've had a chance to unpack some of the challenges with C-11. On C-18, the online news bill, you've written that implementing the bill will be problematic for the CRTC. How so? Well, I mean, where do you want to start? This, this, who does it apply to? Uh, it, I find it incredible that it, in effect, the digital news intermediaries, as they are called, will be determined according to the size of the intermediary operator, the, whether the market for the intermediary gives the operator a strategic advantage, or whether the intermediary occupies a prominent market position. These are all relative tests. These are not absolute tests. How do I apply them? What's the market? What, uh, what, what's the prominent market position? The... Governor and the council are supposed to make regulations under the act clarifying this. The way it is right now is wide open to, and it's very hard to figure who, who can or cannot. The CRTC can ask for information from various people whom they think fall under it, and then presumably on the basis of that, make regulations saying you are subject to it. But I really find this is very strange having an act that is not clear, first of all, who it applies to. And then secondly, who benefits from it? You know, the, beneficial, the, the definition of a ENB, as they call it, eligible news business, is equally weak. I, it, part one is clear, it refers to the Income Tax Act, but part two says it's somewhere in a news, produce news events primarily focused on matters of general interest and reports current events. Now, what are primarily focused? What are matters of general interest? 
and then they have to regularly employ uh, two journalists. All of this is extremely vague and uh, unsatisfactory. Now, the CRTC is not going to thank the government for making it so way, because that means there will be hundreds of submissions saying we are included or no, we are not included. Plus, there's a provision for exemption, which is equally vague and, 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 and difficult to apply. So it seems to me that uh, to think that this will happen very quickly and then that then the people will negotiate, etc. Well, no, I think you're going to have to have a lengthy and difficult hearing to determine who is in a, a DNI and who is an EMV and therefore subject to the act. Again, they are also, the newsmakers are not only people think it uh, applies to newspapers, but also applies to broadcasters. And can you make different, uh, can and should the CRTC make different classes of eligible news benefits? So, so one rule for broadcasters and one rule for for, for newspapers, or should there be thresholds in terms of revenue and, 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 and or in terms of subscribers or listeners or how, however you want? All of this is open. They can do it. They have, it's broadly enough worded that they have the power to do it. But again, as I said at the outset, you have to basically conceptualize this is what I want to do. This is what, what this is meant to me. These are the people I, I think are supposed to be covered and these are supposed to be benefited, etc. Then the act is completely void on how is the benefit to be paid. You know, on what basis is it to be paid into a fund? Is it paid to directly to the, the to the to the people? And it, the act only speaks about money. A lot of this is could be uh, in kind in terms of technology or available access to uh, facilities, etc. Which which uh, and. Lastly, what are the negotiations about? It's not a link, according to the minister. It's not a link test. It's not you're not being, being it's not linking. So then presumably there's an underlying assumption that on a digital news distributor somehow gets more out of linking to news sources than the news sources get out of being linked. And that difference should be shared. Back the question on: Is it true? Is it first of all? Is there, is there a net benefit? And secondly, how do we share it? And it, 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 even if you do share it, do you share it per per, per company, or do, if, if they bargain collectively, how will it be distributed among them? These are all open questions, and it seems to me the only way to do it is as I say. I'm sorry, but I repeat myself: is you think it through. This is how it could work. Lay it out that way and then ask people to comment on it. And as a result of their comment, you amend and et cetera, to come out to finally to a workable product. I mean, that's interesting the, the, you know, to, just to hear about the sheer number of, of issues that you've identified there as well, in part because the government's been at pains to say that the CRTC is not heavily involved in all this. They, they've tried to suggest that this is a light touch approach where basically parties will negotiate if they can't reach agreement the crtc will sort of provide some of the overall coverage of for for an arbitration system and they've established some of the rules of that arbitration system in the legislation but they've tried to argue that this is not that the crtc provides obviously some oversight but they try to argue that we're not directly intervening in the in this in this sector uh, but you've certainly painted a picture that suggests that there is far more crtc involvement than the government has tried to suggest I can't see how it would work otherwise. If you, let's say, okay, you negotiate. First of all, what do you negotiate about? It's not spelled out in the, you know. So uh, you set up, a, you say, a negotiation process. Uh, and if there's a big consultation process and then, then arbitration, government appoints the arbitrators and they can rule, but they can only rule on the monetary side. Well, I back to the, if I was an arbitrator, I said, well, what am I arbitrating about? What are your claims? And the claims come will be completely different. And surely uh, the very first thing uh, the, the digital news uh, people will say is, hey, 
we bestow more, far more benefits than we get out from linking. You know, so what is what are we arbitrating about? Surely it has to be spelled out somewhere, somehow. What what this is? Just saying, hey, you you may negotiate. The first thing, what what are we negotiating about? So whether, <laughs> whether you like it or not, the CRTC will have to set guideposts. At the very, at the very limit, okay. we'll have to see. This is what you do. <laughs> This is what you negotiated about. These are the procedures that you go through. This is who, how you pay whatever award is being made. Yeah. You know, you've mentioned links a few times. I'd be remiss if I didn't yeah. get your thought thoughts on this. You know, the, there there were some initial attempts, where there have been some who have tried to argue that this is not about links. Yet, I certainly, for one, felt that as the hearings took place at the House of Commons, it became abundantly clear that, in fact, links are really the foundation of this legislation. And I thought we saw the broadcasters acknowledge it. And we thought I thought we saw government officials acknowledge it as well. What What are you your views on, on essentially requiring payment for links? Yeah, I think it, um, you, c you can't escape the fact it is links are part of the bargain. You know, it's, it is the benefit you get from links. Um, you can argue there are other benefits that come through being interconnected, et cetera, et cetera. But the core of it is, uh, is a linkage. I mean, the whole legislation, if you come back to the bank, what is this, what is the government trying to do? It seems to me they want to ensure that uh, that people can absorb their news either online or, or uh, by on paper or through the radio with, uh, with equal facility and that somehow that news that is generated either uh, this way should be should should not result in one means or another means being unable to deliver news because it's uneconomic. And so, therefore, you're trying to put these three things together and trying to evolve a system by which they share the profits from the news. But it's very poorly stated, and it's certainly you can't do it hands off the way you suggest that the CRTC not uh, just setting the scheme and saying, here, go to it. Why don't, why don't we close with this? You've identified a whole series of yeah. challenges, certainly with C11, a whole series with C18, which, of course, uh, still may be changed as it heads to the House. You know, how, there are those in both of the industry sectors, the broadcasting side and production side for C11, the news side on C18, who have, have you know pressured the government to move quickly, pressured the committees to move quickly. But how long do you see all of this playing out? You know, there's the question of whether the CRTC is capable of doing it, but then there's even just the pure timelines of doing this and doing this properly. You know, in your vision, what's what's the roadmap here? How long is all of this going to take uh, before we actually see these these pieces of legislation taking actual effect? Well, I think uh, both of them will take. Uh Certainly, C C. Let's start, uh, separate them. I think C eleven will take a longer time. It'll be very difficult to work this out, and it will be contested all along the way. And 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 there will be, uh, I, I'm quite sure, <laughs> major resistance and 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 uh, and probably also uh, you know political pressure from the US US etc. So I would think uh, you're talking two years at the minimum. C18, on paper, you can, uh, once you have identified the part, per parties, etc., and the beneficiaries, and then there's also the, uh, the question of, of, of exemptions, which are spe spelled out, etc. Et it's a whole new, uh, new ballgame. CRTC has never done anything like this. They, have, they really have to learn how to do it uh, and how to... Uh, oversee an arbitration process without putting their fingers into it and get, get, getting being seen to interfering or affecting the arbitration process. This is not something they're used to at all. So uh, again, I, I can't see it to, to maybe a, a little bit faster than, than, than C11 because uh, you, have, you have fewer parties at the one end, but on the other hand, to, there will be considerable dispute as to who's entitled to it and how, etc. So probably a year and a half, I would think. But it, but you know, all of this is, is in the 
We're only talking about broadcasting. As you well know, the CRTC has responsibility for telecom in a field that is not exactly without <laughs> problems these days. So uh, this is overload of the first order. You know, the, some, somehow the new share, share and I wish her all the best. She's got all the collocations she needs for it, etc. It has to systematically separate this and assign priority and delegate and get things put people in charge of this area and that area so to, get, to drive this through. Conrad, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at LawBitesPod or Michael Geist at MGeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.